When is it most difficult for you to trust Jesus? Let's just level the playing field here for a moment. Every single one of us at different points in our journey of following Jesus struggles to trust him. That is the journey of faith. Faith is not mutually exclusive from doubt. They co-mingle often. We see that in the disciples and we see that in our own experience. So when is it difficult for you to trust Jesus? Maybe those doubts creep in and it's like, can I really trust you? Um, 2018, 2019 for me was a season of this. Uh, my body was having, as I was, uh, uh, going to the doctors in the hospital, I was having lots of weird symptoms. I had symptoms of a heart attack. I had symptoms where I, I couldn't breathe. I had dizzy spells. It was like a year and a half, almost two years of this problem. And the doctors didn't know what was going on. My heart was fine. My lungs were fine. Uh, my blood was fine. Everything came back okay. I changed my diet. That didn't help. I changed my exercise routines. That didn't help. And uh, December, 2019, we were in Bandon celebrating Christmas with my family at a beach house. And I was having symptoms of a heart attack. So I went to the Bandon ER and I'm sitting there hooked up to all these machines and got stuff sticking out of me and they're checking everything. And my wife is to my left and I was wrestling with Jesus. Can I really trust you if I live or die? Like, can I really trust you? Because I could trust Jesus for eternity. Like that, that's a long ways away. Or I could trust Jesus with my marriage or my kids, but it was a new thing to me to, to put my actual physical life in his hands. Jesus, can I really trust you if I die? Jesus, can I trust you to take care of my family if I die? And can I trust you to be with me even if I don't die and I continue to have these issues that the doctors can't figure out? Can I really trust you? And my wife was so gracious and loving. She sat there and just read me some of my favorite passages of just Jesus' compassion and love towards people. John 4, Luke 15, just beautiful pictures of trustworthy Jesus. But it was a moment for me. Can I really trust Jesus when things are hard? When I'm going through difficulty, when I have a season of suffering? So when is it hard for you to trust Jesus? Maybe you're watching your kids leave the house and you're looking towards an empty nest and you're biting your nails like, Jesus, can I really trust you with them? I'm not sure about this school or the state they're moving to or the relationship they're engaging in. Jesus, can I really trust you with my children? Or maybe it's finances and you're looking at your financial outlook and you're thinking, God, are you really going to provide for my needs? Can I really trust you? Not my wants, but my needs. Can I really trust you? Or maybe it's relational issues and you're looking at a relationship or a marriage or a parent-child relationship and you're just thinking, Jesus, can I trust you to do something with the mess that this is? We all have seasons where we struggle to trust Jesus. We do today and so did the people in scripture. Today, we're gonna be continuing our series through the book of Mark where we're gonna look at the disciples in a moment where they struggle to trust Jesus when difficulty arises. And so to give us a little bit of context of where we've been in the book of Mark up to this point, Jesus' ministry is booming. It's the heyday of his ministry. He's got lots of people coming from all over the countryside to hear him teach. When he teaches, there's a crowd always. And his influence is gaining so much so that the religious leaders are now starting to engage in his ministry. They're coming to his teaching events. They're, they're there and they're actually, a couple of times we've seen them go toe to toe with Jesus. Right? Calling him a blasphemer in their, in their own minds. They're thinking he's a blasphemer because he's claiming to be God. We've seen Jesus with teaching uh, with authority and power, exercising demons. We've seen him healing paralytics. We've seen him doing miraculous things. And last week we saw as Jesus was teaching a large crowd. He's out on the Sea of Galilee in a boat and he's projecting his voice into this natural amphitheater and he's teaching a large, a large crowd in parables. And as that day comes to a close is where we pick up today. And I'm gonna be reading from my Bible. We have a lot of text to get through today. So I won't, it won't be on the screen. So if you wanna follow along with me in your own Bible or on the Bible app, um, you join me in Mark 4, starting in verse 35. So on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go to the other side. So he's finished teaching and they all get in the boat and they're going to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. 
So it's not just Jesus' 12 disciples here. There's other boats, other men and women who are following him to the other side of the sea. And other boats were with him. So when it says that Jesus was just as he was, so, uh, many commentators make a point of this, that Jesus has just got done being face to face with need all day long. He was ministering to people. He was teaching. And I can say from experience, my own experience of teaching is there is a special type of exhaustion that comes on the other side of preaching. There just is. Like you're pouring your heart out there for people to see and not to mention you're preaching before the principalities and powers that are in opposition to the gospel. And so Jesus here is dog tired. He's just got done preaching and he's been face to face with need all day long. Parents know what that's like, right? Jesus was keenly aware of everybody's need. Just like a parent's aware of what the toddler needs, what the teenager needs, and I got to get this for them for school and they got to have lunch and dinner. And he's aware of everybody's needs and he's exhausted. And so they take him just as he is exhausted into the boat. And I think this is so important. Jesus honored his human limits. Yes, he was fully God, but he's also fully human. And here we see him exhausted. And we're going to see the natural outflow of exhaustion is sleep. Verse 37, and a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. Picture this moment. You've left the sea with Jesus. You're going to the other side. There was, you're leaving this massive crowd. There's other boats with you. And a violent, spontaneous storm just comes out of nowhere. This is the Sea of Galilee. It, was, it is known for these types of violent, spontaneous storms. that just kind of throw everything into a tizzy. And think about the people on the boat. Some of them are experienced fishermen. They know how to navigate these storms and they are losing it. They're bailing water out. I think this, this is total chaos. It is amazing to me that Jesus was able to sleep through this, through the wind howling and the boat filling and the waves crashing. And you know, the apostle Peter has got a lot to say in this moment because he's always got a lot to say. And I'm sure he's the one trying to command the situation and everybody's freaking out. We're going to die. And Jesus is in the back totally knocked out. This is that type of sleep where you kind of wake up and you got lines on your face and you're just like, where am I? He's just knocked out cold, right? He's exhausted. And they woke him, verse 38, they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now it would have been one thing for them to awaken Jesus and say, hey, the boat's filling with water. Can you help? But there's an accusation within their question. They say, teacher, rabbi, do you not care that we are perishing? They remind him, he's the teacher, he's the leader, he's the rabbi, we're the disciples. You got to have command of this situation. But the implication of their question is, Jesus, you don't really care about this situation. You don't care about us dying out here in the water. You don't care that you're going to die out here. What about the kingdom? You said you're bringing the kingdom of God. You said you're going to set people free. We've seen you do miraculous things and it's all going to end in a storm because you won't help. Don't you care? There is a natural assumption and it's really an attack on Jesus' character here in this moment. And it's so interesting how Jesus responds because he doesn't respond to their question. Verse 39, and he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. So I think this is the moment where everybody is trying to save their lives and save their rabbi and they're bailing water out the side of the thing. They attack Jesus for not for sleeping in the back. And then Jesus wakes up, stands up, looks at the commotion, looks at the wind and the waves and what has everybody else stirred up does not have Jesus stirred up. And Jesus has, uh, he exercises his power. He's a powerful presence. And he says, peace. Be still. There's exclamation points after those statements in the text because this is a command. This is Jesus, creator God, being uh, commanding his creation, being in total control of the chaotic situation. And the sea stops and the waves stop. Everything stills. And then I think all eyes train on Jesus as there's like a collective gasp. 
Verse 40, he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Now, I want to be clear. Jesus is not rebuking them for fearing. Okay? Small boat in a big storm. There's good reason to be afraid. What he's rebuking them for is their lack of faith. Jesus already told them they will go to the other side of the lake. They're not trusting what he has said. Beyond that, they've seen him do incredible things up to this point. They've seen him teach with authority and power. They've seen him exercise demons. They've seen him heal people of ailments. They've seen him claim to be God over and over and over again in the, in the early pages of the book of Mark. They've experienced all of this. And Jesus is saying, you still don't trust me? Have you still no faith? He's not rebuking them for their fear. He's rebuking them for their lack of faith. Yes, this is a scary situation. He's saying, but you can trust me even in scary situations, even in difficulties, trials, and tribulations. Verse 41. And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? The Jewish mind of the day, uh, the, the idea was only God could command the weather. In fact, in an extra biblical biblical book, 2 Maccabees, there's a a verse, uh, several verses in there that talk about somebody who claims to have control over the weather and they're called a blasphemer because only God has control over the weather. Jesus just proved his control and power right before everybody. And they're all looking at him and it says, with great fear. This idea of great fear isn't just a reverential awe The literal rendering of this from the original language is to be so seized with fear that it puts someone to flight. You know, fight, flight, or freeze. These disciples, if they weren't in a boat, they'd be running away. They are terrified at what they just experienced. And I want to, as we talked about this on the teaching team, it was such a rich conversation. Sometimes I just wish you could peer into those conversations that we have on Wednesdays. Um, But as we were talking about this, Heather Jones, our life group director, she said, what if Jesus is the only space, the only person where you can be fully known, fully loved, and fully safe, and yet also being in his presence is kind of terrifying because he is a holy God. What if Jesus holds this unique space where you're fully known and fully loved and fully safe, and yet there is a, a holy, fearful dread of being in the presence of the all-powerful God? That's what they're experiencing here. And, and fear begins to well up in them, and they begin to ask, who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? What I want us to pull out of this first portion uh, from Mark 4 is that difficulty causes questioning. The disciples are in a tizzy and rightly so. This is a scary situation. They're bailing water out. Jesus is asleep and they attack him. They attack his character. Look at it again in the passage. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion and they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Don't you care? Like get, get a bucket, like help us out. We need to get the water. We're all going to die. You're going to die. The kingdom's going to end right here. We don't want to be the people who let the Messiah die in the Sea of Galilee. Like we got to do something, Jesus. Don't you care? And in the difficulty, in the trial they're in the midst of, they begin to question, God, are you really good? God, do you really care about me? And moving on, verse 40, he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? After he's calmed the wind, calmed the sea, and they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? They're questioning in their hearts and minds, who is this guy? And, and, and rightly so. They just experienced the power of God on full display right before them. But they were questioning Jesus, do you really care? Do you really love us? And Jesus wakes up and proves to them that he does care, that he is present. Difficulties in life cause us to question who God is. Listen, following Jesus is not up always up and to the right. It's just not. We are broken people 
in relationship with other broken people in a broken world. Naturally, as a result of that brokenness, difficulties, trials, and tribulations will come. Following Jesus doesn't make all of that go away. Following Jesus means that he's in the boat with us in the midst of those trials, in the midst of those difficulties. There is nothing you will ever, ever walk through that he's not right there with you. And I, w- I want to be careful about how I say this. In this story, Jesus stops the storm. But Jesus does not stop every storm. We see his power to do so, but he does not stop every storm. Sometimes we're walking through storms, difficulties, trials, tribulations, and we don't just get immediately removed from them. Sometimes instead of uh, vindicating us out of it, he, he helps us go through it. The difference is, is, is Jesus in the boat with you? It makes all the difference in how you handle difficulties, trials, how you go through the storms. But they're they're asking themselves, can we really trust this guy? He doesn't seem to care. Things got hard and he doesn't look trustworthy. The difficulty causes them to question. So let me ask you, when you walk through difficulties, whether it's relational, financial, whatever it is, when you walk through difficulties, What's your response to Jesus? Are you holding fast to him even when things don't make sense? He doesn't stop every storm because sometimes the storm have a purpose we don't see and maybe we'll never see. But he can be with us and he is with us in the midst of all of it. So what is your response? The disciples are questioning the character of God. God, are you good? in the midst of this difficulty. That's what I was doing on the hospital bed too. God, can I really trust you? Are you good if I, if I, if this ends my life? Are you good if I have the permanent physical issue in my body for the rest of my life? What is your response to Jesus in the midst of difficulties? So Jesus, he calms this storm. And I think it's a silent boat ride to the other side of the lake for the rest of the time because they are just in dread and fear. They're in awe of the power of God they just saw. And then they get to the other side and it's like out of the frying pan into the fire. They come face to face with another very scary situation. Chapter five, verse one. They came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes. This is also called the Gadarenes and other places in scriptures. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. So it's as though Jesus takes one foot, steps on the shore, and immediately he's got this demon-possessed, bloodied, shackled, broken shackles, naked guy running straight for him. Like if you're a disciple, I'm going to be like, dude, let's go to the other side of the lake. Like, this does not look like good peoples over here. I, I, don't, I don't know that we should be here. This is scary. And this guy comes running towards Jesus. And it continues, verse 5, Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Some commentators say that crying out and that cutting with stones is him trying to get the demon to leave. That if he cuts himself and creates an opening in his body, maybe that'll be an exit for the demon. And so there's a man who's in an utterly desperate situation, hopeless, bound in more ways than one. And he comes face to face with Jesus. Verse six. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? So the demon within the man asks Jesus the question. The demon recognizes and acknowledges Jesus. And isn't it interesting that the demon goes into a posture of submission, falls down before Jesus and says, what do you have to do with me, son of the most high God? This was a common phrase that Gentiles would use for Yahweh, son of the most high God. Verse eight, or verse seven, rather. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. 
For he was saying to him, Jesus saying to the demon-possessed man, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. This man is three times over unclean. He's got an unclean spirit. He's a Gentile and he's living among the tombs, which from a Jewish perspective made him ceremonially unclean. And he comes in pre- into the presence of Jesus and Jesus declares, you're going to come out of this man. Again, we're going to see Jesus' power on full display here. Jesus is a powerful presence throughout this passage. And Jesus asked him, verse 9, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. I don't think we can overstate the darkness of that statement. This guy is not just possessed by one demon. There are many within him. This is a soul that is so hopeless. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. So the demon is begging Jesus, don't send us out of the country. Now, many commentators say this is because this uh, this legion had uh, a particular influence in this Gentile area. Gentiles were often pagans. They worship idols and that perhaps this uh, legion was attached to some of that worship and that he was the principality and power over this area. So he begs Jesus to not let him leave the area. Now, we don't know why Jesus does what he does next. There's lots of conjecture. The reality is we don't know. But here's what happens. They begged him saying, send us into the pigs. Let us enter them. Verse 13. So he gave them permission and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs and the herd numbering about 2000 rushed down the steep bank and into the drowned sea or into the sea and drowned. The herdsmen, those who own the pigs, fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what, uh, to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. So here's this crazy moment where Jesus comes face to face with a man who's possessed by many demons. And he says, come out. And then Jesus has this very odd interchange with the demon who's within the man. Don't let us leave this. Don't make us leave this area. And for whatever reason, Jesus allows them to enter the pigs and they run and drown into the sea. This causes a commotion where the herdsmen go to the city and tell what has happened. Some of the townsfolk come to, uh, come to where Jesus and the demon possessed man are and they see him sitting in his right mind and they're terrified. They were more comfortable with the presence of evil in their midst than they are seeing the uncontainable, uncontrollable presence of God in Jesus. Up until this moment, this man has been a problem to be managed, not a person to be loved. A problem to be managed. They've tried to bind him and shackle him. They've relegated him to the tombs, the land of the dead. They've ostracized him from community. Nobody can really keep him contained and under control, but they, they have tried to quarantine this issue. They've seen him as a problem. And then Jesus sees him as a person who needs freedom and commands the spirit. And again, Jesus and Satan and the demons are not equal opposites. Satan is not God's equal opposite. He is always in scripture. When Jesus comes toe to toe with uh, demons or evil forces, they always must submit to Jesus. Jesus is all powerful. Satan is not. And we see this clearly in this passage. And so this man is set free. What I want us to pull out of this is Jesus is the only one who sets people free. Like there's been lots of people trying to manage this man's situation. They've been shackling him. They've been binding him. And he's even been trying to manage it by cutting himself. Hopefully the, hoping that the demon would, would release, uh, would go out through the wounds. None of this has helped. He was hopeless until he met Jesus. And Jesus sets him free. He says, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Come out of the man. Jesus is the only one who has the power to overthrow demonic forces. You and I don't. This guy doesn't. We are no match for a very real and very great spiritual enemy. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing when it comes to spiritual battle. But in Christ, we have victory over the enemy. He has been defeated on the cross. 
The cross that Jesus took the wrath of God and died in our place and rose again, overcoming all of our enemies, including Satan, sin, and the grave. And because of that, we now stand victorious over the enemy because of Christ's victory. And the people come and they see the demon-possessed man who is in his right mind. Think about what this meant for this guy. Who knows how long he's been in bondage and darkness and hopeless. And now there's light. God saw him and he's free. This is an amazing, miraculous moment for this guy. But the townspeople are terrified because the uncontainable power of God is in their presence. And that is scary. They know the power of Satan. They've experienced it. They try to control it. But the power of God, this is something new. And this is a pivotal moment in the ministry of Jesus. So far in the book of Mark, Jesus has been ministering to Jews. In the New Testament pages, there are essentially two kind of people groups. The Jewish people, which had the temple, the sacrifices, the law. And then there's the Gentiles who were outside of that. They didn't have the temple, the sacrifices. They, they didn't worship Yahweh. They often were pagans, would worship idols. And Jesus crosses the sea into the land of the outcasts, the Gentile, the Gerasenes, Gadarenes, which had a mostly Gentile influence. We know that also from the pigs in the story. Jewish people did not eat pork, so the presence of pigs indicates this is Gentile territory. And so he goes into the land of the outcasts, the land of people who were not a part of the covenant, who were not included in God's promises in the Old Testament. And now he's saying the kingdom of God is being advanced even among the Gentiles. And he sets this man free. Jesus sets people free. He did then, and he still does so today. So where do you need freedom? Is there a cycle you're walking in of addiction? Jesus is greater. Is there maybe a spiritual battle you're in that is scary, and maybe maybe you really relate to the demoniac? Man, it feels hopeless and dark and despairing, and there's this oppressive or possessive nature of the enemy. There's hope in Jesus. Jesus is the one who sets people free. Maybe you're there, you're sitting here and you're like, ah, ah, things are going pretty well for me. Who do you know that has a story like the demoniac that needs freedom? I think the townspeople looked at the demoniac and said, he's a lost cause. Lock him up in the graveyard. We'll just leave it there. Try to manage the problem over there. He's a lost cause until he met Jesus. Who do you know that needs freedom? Begin praying for their freedom. Begin sharing the love of Jesus with them because only in Jesus can we find true freedom. And so the townspeople come. They're terrified of what Jesus has done. And verse 17, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might be with him. Think about what this guy was feeling as Jesus is leaving. This is the guy who just, who just gave you freedom. For the first time, you're in a sound mind. For the first time, you're in control of your faculties. And he's leaving. What if they come back, Jesus? Can I go with you just in case this doesn't take and they come back? And maybe it's worse next time. I've tried this on my own. And so he begs Jesus, can I go with you? Verse 19. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Jesus doesn't allow him to come. He says, actually, I've got a better mission for you. I've got a a better calling for you than coming and being with me. I want you to go back to the city that you live in. And I want you to tell your friends, your family. I want you to tell the people you have influence over what the Lord has done for you. The word there that Jesus uses in the original language is oikos. Oikos is your sphere of influence. The people with whom you live, work, and play. You've heard that language probably many times here at Family Church. We talk about this all the time. The people with whom you live, work, and play. We get that idea directly from this passage. He didn't say, Jesus didn't allow him to come and be a part of his ministry elsewhere. He said, no, you have influence here. People know your story and I want you to go back and tell them what the Lord has done for you. Jesus sends us on mission. 
He did that for this, for this demonic. Look, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. This is his calling. This is his mission. Go tell everybody. Think about what this meant for the demoniac though. He's going back to the place where his brokenness has been on full display to minister. That's scary. Like he's going back to the people who know his bondage, who know his brokenness, who know his sin, who have been trying to keep him contained and shackled. And his job is to go back to them and proclaim I have a pretty good idea of what the demoniac was feeling in this moment because it's something I feel often. When I was in junior high and high school, I was addicted to drugs and dealing drugs. And I had at my early adulthood, uh, several arrests, drug related, probation related arrests. And um, as soon as I became a Christian and got married, I wanted nothing more than to get out of Douglas County. I want to get out of the place where my brokenness has been on full display for everybody to see. People who see me and they remember, oh yeah, he stole from me or he lied to me or he did this to support his addiction. And so I moved away for a couple of years and then God called us back and then God called me into ministry. And there is a special pain serving in a context and sharing the gospel in a context where your brokenness has been on full display. But what I've learned is it's also a very beautiful place for the grace of God to be displayed in the life of a broken person. And so as as you reflect on this story of a man who has a Jesus story, a Jesus freedom story, and then he's called to go tell that, who, who do you know that needs to hear your story? What is your Jesus story? You're called to go even to the places that know your brokenness even if that's your home or your workplace or wherever, because if the grace, the grace of God shines brightly through our brokenness as we share the gospel, as we share the truth of who Jesus is, what if the places that know your brokenness fully might see Jesus more clearly through your story? You're called on mission just like this man This story ends with, I love the ending of this story. And he went away and began to proclaim. The word there for proclaim is actually preach. He's a preacher now. Former demoniac, current preacher. He went to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. So he lives in the uh, Garasa, which was a part of the Decapolis. So he goes back and he tells people about what Jesus has done for him, but he doesn't stop there. He goes to the Decapolis, which is the wider area around it, and he's telling everybody about what the Lord has done for him. And look at the impact. Everyone marveled. They know this guy as the crazy lunatic who's demon-possessed, cutting himself naked, bound in shackles, and now he's clothed and in his right mind and talking about Jesus. What a story. You have a Jesus story. And those that God has given you influence, he's not placed you in your workplace or in your family or in your friend group on accident. You're there intentionally for this purpose that everybody might hear and see the story of Jesus in and through you and marvel at the wonder of Jesus and come to him that they might have their own Jesus story as well. So what's your Jesus story and who needs to hear it? I'm going to release to the campuses. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you guys so much for sticking around and and hanging out with us here today at Family Church. It's a joy to get to open the scriptures with you. And uh, I just want to leave us with just really two challenges to evaluate as, as we've looked at two really powerful stories of Jesus' presence and power displayed before everybody. Firstly, where is it difficult for you to trust Jesus? We all struggle. The disciples struggled. I struggle. And I know you do too. So where is it in your life right now that you're struggling to trust Jesus? Evaluate that with your spouse, with your kids, with your parent, with a trusted friend. Evaluate that and and hold an honest mirror up to your life and and say, is there an area of my life that I'm, I'm just not trusting him right now? And what might that look like to give that space over to Jesus today in prayer? The second thing I want to leave us with today is what is your Jesus story? The number one thing I get asked 
when, uh, when people find out that they're called to go and make disciples is, what do I say? And as we think through the blessed rhythm and we begin in prayer, God, where are you working around me and how might I join you in that? Then we're listening to people. That part's not talking, it's listening. Maybe there's some asking of good questions, but it's really listening to their heart, their story, their hurts, their joys, and then inviting them into your life, eating meals together, serving one another, and ultimately sharing your story. This is the part where we actually share the hope that we have. But how do we do that? And I just break it down into three simple ways. First, or three simple parts, rather. Firstly, what was life like before Jesus? Second, how did you encounter Jesus? And third, how has your experience with Jesus impacted you? What is, how, how has Jesus begun transforming you? Not perfectly, but increasingly throughout your life. And another piece that's always important to keep in our Jesus story is the reality that we're not finished products. Just because we come to Jesus doesn't mean our life is perfect. Be honest and vulnerable about the spaces in your life that you're still wrestling with Jesus. Maybe even this question that we asked a couple seconds ago, where it's difficult for you to still trust. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you're gracious towards us when we don't trust you. And thank you, God, that you are uh, so powerful, that you set people free and send them out, that others might find freedom as well. I pray that Family Church would be a beacon of hope in a dark place. I pray for the person hearing this right now, God, that you would give them hope if they're in darkness, that Jesus would just meet them in that darkness. And Lord, I pray that their Jesus story would begin right now. And God, for those who are listening and have a Jesus story, I pray that they would have boldness and courage to go out and live out that blessed rhythm and tell others everything that the Lord has done for them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Love you. Have a good Sunday.